Okay, hello everybody. I'm Sam Berger. Yay. I'm going to be an instructor for this hour. Hi. There will be a test at the end. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome to the Idioms Guide to World Building, aka Cultural Linguistics for Writers. So, just to get us started, really important to note, idioms and metaphors affect the way language is used, but not the way language is built. So, like, if you want to build your own language in your, like, a fictional foreign language in your world, that's not what I'm covering here. That's called conlanging. You can go look that up. David J. Peterson wrote a book on it. It's amazing. He'll teach you how to make the phonetics of a language. Excuse me, what's the word again? Conlang. 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 Thank you. C-O-N-L-A-N-G. Conlang. Can you repeat the author again? David J. Peterson. I mentioned it here. Uh, he's the linguist behind the languages on Game of Thrones, The 100, uh, and a lot more shows, uh, Starcrossed. He does languages on movies. He's also a friend of mine. So this whole presentation is David J. Peterson approved. Uh, he even says, culture has no impact whatsoever, the same with any other language, on the sounds of a language. Uh, the place where culture has an impact is in the words that are present and how they are used. So, I'm trying to think. So, if you're thinking regional accents, the regional accent of Texas compared to the regional ac uh, uh, accent of Seattle has nothing to do with the culture of Texas. It was just a group of isolated people in this area started saying the word orange this way, whereas the group of isolated people over here say it this way. But it was not the culture of Texas being southern that made it sound that way. No. So. To get started, um, you need to understand conceptual metaphors. These are things we learn at a very young age. They are learned through our interactions with the environment around us. And the process is largely subconscious. We are not aware that this is happening. So we build the concept of what is a whiteboard by seeing the whiteboard, by watching other people interact with it, by interacting with a whiteboard ourselves. We understand the color white by seeing it and by interacting with it. But if you go somewhere where they do not have the color white, and you try to explain white to somebody, like white is snow, like they're like, I don't know what that means. That means nothing because they have no concept for what white is. So we use these basic concepts, what is white, what is hard, what is a hot day, what is a cold day. We map those concepts onto more complex things. So a complex thing would be love. Uh, a concrete thing might be, what is a battlefield? Love is a battlefield. We understand what a battlefield looks like and the struggle of that. When you map those things on top of each other and you say love is a battlefield, suddenly we start to understand love is a struggle, love can be painful, love can be hard, love doesn't always mean win, love means that there are sacrifices. So you've mapped a concrete concept to a vague concept to give meaning. Uh, so, love is a journey. Look how far we've come. Look how far we've come is the metaphor or idioms that we'll be talking about. But the, the concept of love is a journey, we know what a journey is. That is a concrete thing to travel from one place to another where you have experiences between. An argument is war. Love is madness. Intimacy is warmth. And the lack of intimacy is coldness. Um, those are the more vague things that, again, we have mapped to concrete things to give understanding. Other cultures will have different concrete uh, concepts and different vague concepts that they will have mapped together, and that's where we'll start building uh, our deeper worlds. So, metaphor is not simply or even primarily used for artistic or rhetorical purposes. Its primary purpose is to allow us to better understand abstract concepts. So as writers, we use metaphor as like, oh, that's the pretty prose that we're going to put in to the hero's going to describe his love for the heroine. We think of metaphor that way, but he's using metaphor to describe the abstract concept of his love for this beautiful woman through the concrete concepts. Metaphor is uh, often not based on similarities. It is based on systematic correspondence, the mappings that I was telling you about, uh, of elements from the concrete source onto the more abstract target. Idioms, build off of these conceptual metaphors that ground a culture. 
idioms are just more fanciful uh, than the normal metaphors. When world building, identify if you're using an English conceptual metaphor. Does that fit within the world you're building? Uh, if you're building a world full of lizard people, you might be using the idioms that make sense for humans, but not for lizard men. So decide whether or not you, you like that metaphor, if you can adapt it to the culture you're building, if you can substitute it for a better metaphor, or if you need to avoid them entirely. Any questions so far? I'm covering a lot of very heavy stuff, so if you get confused, feel free to pop your hand up. Relationship between language and cultural identity. All societies express much of their culture through language. Culture is prose, poetry, theater, ritual, so religion, jokes, sayings, songs, etc. Language is the single most important thing across culture that identifies a group. Uh, belonging to the group means you have to learn that language. So if you are going to belong to a prep, jock, goth, geek group at high school, those are all the subgroups, you have to know their language. A goth is not necessarily going to fit in with the jocks unless they can speak the language that the jocks speak. Otherwise, it literally, you've had those times where you're talking to somebody and you're like, you said words that were technically English, but I have no idea what you said because you don't have the concept to map them to. So example, let's look at some slang. On fleek, Monday morning quarterback. Baby back, skill monkey. I had to look up <laughs> slang and look up what these definitions meant. I have, I've, I've been hearing the on fleek, which is a rising slang. I did not know what it means, and it means something that is good or perfect, meeting a person's standards. I think that's that's pretty cool slang. But if I didn't belong to that culture, I don't use it. I'm still not going to use it. <laughs> but I didn't know Monday morning quarterback. Again, this is sports line. I don't sports ball. So I don't know, I didn't know what this meant. I meant what this meant. It is a person who doesn't participate, yet levels criticism with the benefit of hindsight. So football happens on Sunday. Everybody gathers around the water cooler on Monday morning to talk about what the quarterback did wrong and how they could have done better. It's a Monday morning quarterback. You weren't playing the game. You only know that they could have done that play better because you saw how it went wrong after the fact and had time to analyze it. Baby bat, nickname for a newcomer to the golf scene. It can be an endearment or insult, depending on the circumstances. Skill monkey, this is for video game geeks. A person who provides minim minimal combat support damage, but has uh, many other talents and skills that keep them useful to the party. So, I'm totally a skill monkey when I play video games. I don't do any damage, but I do other cool things. Cultural linguistics is the study between uh, the relationship between language and culture and how different groups perceive them. If culture were a house, then language is the key to the front door and to all rooms inside it. Without it, you end up without a proper home, home or legitimate identity. <clears throat> so you can world build, you can think you have all this cool stuff, but if they still talk like they're from Los Angeles, California, and they're supposed to be in this high fantasy world, something is missing. So their language has to match the world you're building for them. And we're going to watch a real quick video of this place. When cultural linguistics and world building collide, this is a one minute, 16 second video from Game of Thrones. Pay attention and see what you can learn about their world and what is important to them from how they, the, the language, the actual idioms and metaphors and concepts in the language. Oh, or I can hit the wrong side button. Okay, so there's no sound. So the stallion who mounts the world has no need for a throne. According to the prophecy, the stallion will ride to the ends of the earth. The earth ends at the black salt sea. No horse can cross the poison water. The earth does not end at the sea. There are many dirts beyond the sea. The dirt where I was born. No, not dirts, lands. Lands, yes. There are thousands of ships in free cities, wooden horses that fly across the sea. Let's not speak of the wooden horses and of iron chairs. It's not a chair, it's a, and here she's struggling, throne. Throne, okay. 
pulpit for some reason. A chair for a king to sit upon. So she said throne in not Dothraki. She had to say it in another language because Dothraki doesn't have a word for throne. So that says something about the culture right there. A king does not need a chair to sit upon. He needs only a horse. And then there's Kissy Kiss. <laughs> also, in the um, when she um, she asked a translator how to say thank you. Do you remember that scene? Mm -hmm. The translator says there is no word in the Dothraki language yep. for gratitude. Yeah. So you can start seeing how it doesn't mean that they are not grateful. It just means that they're not expressing it the way another culture does. So. In their language, there's no need for the word for throne. So she's, you saw her struggle for, well, how do I express that concept for this very special chair? Um, you saw, saw the language when they were talking about poor wooden horses that fly across the, the sea. So you start getting this idea of what's important and what's not important. You see them when they're talking about their land is called dirts. They're, they're dirts, whereas the other places aren't dirts. They're their land. Those are, that's a distinction. You have clearly, everything is land, everything is dirt, but they have given it different meaning. Here are some of their common, uh, some sayings. Uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce them in Dothraki because again, I'm not here for the phonetics, but the translation, ride well, is a common farewell. I ride to eating, which means I'm about to go eat. I ride from eating, I just ate. I ride well today, I feel well. Do you ride well today? How are you doing? Uh, my favorite, and I, again, I think it's Frederick. Frederick. I'm just butchering it. I'm sorry, David. He's somewhere. He's feeling the pain. Um, is an insult that you can call somebody who is an overly talkative person, and it literally means like the sound of a horse's hooves. And speaking for all the Fredericks of the world. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you can sort of start seeing. Seems like horses are an important part of this culture. If this is how they're saying, yeah, I, I'm not feeling too well today, I'm not riding well. And they're not actually talking about literally riding a horse, they're just saying, I'm, yeah, I'm not riding well today, I'm not feeling well. Horses are important. Horses are the heart of the culture. The dog Dothraki are aka the horse lords. Wealth is measured by the possession of horses. They spend most of their life riding horses. The horse is a, de uh, is a deity, it's their mount, it's a food source. Um, they are nomadic, so again, horses are important for them to move their people around. Many cultural taboos are directly associated with the horse. Fear of salt water that horses will not drink. The horse is not going to drink that water, then I should not drink that water, because that water, the horse is telling me, is bad water. Also, horses cannot cross the sea, so then I should not cross the sea. Contempt of cities. If you're a civilization built around horse culture, and tiny cities with narrow streets, like that's not conducted to having a big herd of horses trampling through. You don't want to live in there. You can't be free to ride your horse. You are trapped in a city. Uh, people who are unable to ride are looked down on because riding capacity uh, or capability is associated with social prestige. You could live in this culture your entire life. If you fall off a horse every time you try to mount, you are not somebody that's going to be respected in that culture. Uh, and upon death, they slaughter the horse and sacrifice it with their... Because you don't want to go into the afterlife without your horse. You need your mount with you still. So you see, what's most important to their culture directly affects their language and how they're going to talk to each other. Idioms is a phrase with an established meaning that is not deducible from the individual words. It's raining cats and dogs. If you say that to somebody who has never heard it before, never had it explained, they're literally going to go, I... <laughs> uh, there is a video that was going to make it around some social media, and it is an adult man trying to teach a toddler boy how to play t-ball. And you see him going, okay, now keep your eye on the ball, eye on the ball, and you see the little boy has his bat, and he's looking at the ball on the tee, and suddenly he drops the bat and walks forward and puts his <laughs> eye to the ball. And the adult man just is like, oh no. And then goes and hugs him. He's like, you're too precious for this world. How could you not understand what I meant? He did it. He took it literally. Eye on the ball. He didn't have the concept that eye on the ball just means just make sure you're looking. 
at the ball. Uh, there's a lot within our world, there are a lot of idioms and metaphors to do with tigers. Because tigers represent power. So have a tiger by the tail. If you have a tiger by the tail, what's at the other end of the tail? The business end. If you have a tiger by the tail, that business end is going to whip around and you're going to be in pain. Uh, there's also the Chinese proverb, he who rides the tiger is afraid to dismount. If you know what a tiger is, you know it's a predator, then you can understand that Chinese proverb fairly easily. Yeah, I don't want to, if I'm on the tiger, I want to stay on the tiger because I don't want the tiger to eat me. I'm going to be clinging to it. Put a tiger in your tank. Put power in your car's tank. Give your, give your car the power of a tiger. A tiger economy, which I did not know this one, had to look up. A dynamic economy in a small country. Again, something that is powerful. They are imbuing other concepts with the concept of a powerful tiger. Uh, eye of the tiger, we all know that song. To have the eye of the tiger, to have power within you. And uh, this would be like the antonym of idioms. A paper tiger is something that is trying to, pretend, trying to present itself as a threat and is no threat. Who's going to be afraid of a paper tiger? Like a little origami tiger? No. That's no threat at all. So now here's when we're going to start putting this to use. So make sure you have paper pens out. We're going to pick what is important to your culture that you're building. So horses, trees, money, and something that is symbolically important to your world. What you want to know is if this is an idiom that most people would know within your world, or is it known to a subset of people? How does your character react to hearing a specific idiom? Are they in the group or are they confused by what they just heard? How do other characters react when your protag uses an idiom? Do the other characters know what your character is talking about? Are they part of the group? Or do you have to explain it to them? And then this is this is where you would pepper that sort of those idioms throughout your world. An example I'm gonna give you that I built. <clears throat> the whole world doesn't need to know the idioms you're building. Imagine a convent of women who make their living off of weaving goods. The head mother's warp is about to snap. You know weaving? It means you're implying that a warp should not have a whole lot of tension. If it's about to snap, that means too much tension. Head mother is stressed out beyond belief. God made that girl with the most balanced weave I've ever seen. Implying an even temperament, because the warp and the weft, that's the directions of the, the threads, don't pull too hard in any one direction. She's even healed, which is another idiom. Odie. Is she going to be the guide string the rest of us are judged by? A guide string is a non stretchy cord used to, uh, it's the same length as the warp. So as you're getting ready to set up your weaving, it's just a set length. And then you have to get your the rest of your yarn and make it all that same length going back and forth. So. Almost that whole thing, like, is that going to be the yardstick the rest of us are measured by? So you can start bringing these things in. A visitor to this convent, upon hearing that stuff, is going to be confused. They're not a weaver. They don't know what any of that stuff means. They need to have it explained to them. So if you have somebody say an idiom, and somebody is, what? It instantly marks them as an outsider to that culture. So what we're going to do is you're going to create an idiom Something similar to raining cats and dogs. Raining cats and dogs just means it's raining heavily out there. Then where it comes from, where we think it comes from, is old medieval superstition and mythology, and also a little bit to do with when uh, medieval England had really bad hygiene and the streets were filled with trash, and animals would die and just litter the streets, and then it would rain real hard, and the floodwaters would come through and wash the dead animal carcasses, and you'd go back out and look at look at all those dead cats. It must have rained really hard for dead cats to rain out of the sky. That's where I think that comes from. So try to think of your culture. Think of a, an idiom, something that could be related to the weather that's specific to your world, where it's either religion or mythology. So you can do that one. I'm going to give you another one. Turn a blind eye. It means you pretend, you pretend to not have seen it. You want to take out the trash, but I turned a blind eye. This one I think is hilarious because it's, we, we know exactly where this came from. There was um, Lord Nelson had lost his point of his eye in a battle. Fast forward a few years, they're at another battle. 
and his commanding officer is giving the signal to retreat. And Lord Nelson takes up his spyglass and puts it to his blind eye, his non-existent eye, and is basically literally going like, I don't see no signal. Keep going. That's what that comes from. So again, when you're building idioms, also think about this history. So you're using mythology to build your idioms, using history, so you could have something that harkens back to a historical event that's not anywhere near your timeline, but if you use it, you can then have one of those outside characters go, wait, what does that mean? Where did that come from? And you can explain a little bit, drop in a little bit of history in your world. Pop calling the kettle black. Someone who criticizes another for something that they are guilty of. Uh, back in the medieval kitchens, both pots and kettles were made from sturdy cast iron and would turn black from the soot of the open fire. So everybody knows, black kettle, black pot. Oh, I went. You, you spend too much money. Uh, excuse me, who just bought the Louis Vuitton bag? Right? She called me greedy, but when I saw her take an extra cookie when no one was looking, talk about the pot, kettle, calling the kettle black. Once in a blue moon is one of my favorite idioms because I was like, where does that even come from? The moon does not turn blue. How do we get that? We think it comes from an old, obsolete, extinct word, uh, belu, uh, B, uh, spelled B E L E W, the, uh, which meant to betray. So it referred to a betrayer moon, which happened very rarely, but during uh, Lent. If you had that extra moon, you had to have an extra month of Lent. So an extra month of giving up something you really want. The moon has betrayed me. Uh, eventually that word fell out of use, but the phrase didn't. So the language had to adapt a new word in its place, and a word that sounded similar was blue as in the color blue. So you, again, you can build idioms where, even within your world, some of the meaning has been lost. You know it harkens back to something, but some of the, the people who would know, or you know, the few weird geeks, and then everybody else is just using it. <laughs> don't bite off more than you can chew. Don't uh, oh, that's uh, don't take on a task beyond what you're capable of accomplishing. Uh, back in the 1800s, men would often chew tobacco, and the greedier men would bite off a big chunk of the tobacco, and then they they can't actually chew that massive wad that's sitting in their mouth, and they look like a fool. <laughs> Right? So, uh, I bit off more than I can chew by taking both advanced astrophysics and advanced interpretive dance this semester. Right? Knight in shining armor. A heroic, idealized male who typically comes to the rescue of a female. Uh, it grew in popularity during the Victorian era when they had this romanticized idea of knights coming to re uh, rescue the damsels in distress. He saved me from hum humiliation, he's my knight shining armor. So it is a pretty image. Here he comes, shining with the sun, lifting off of his armor. However, think about this. Knights are supposed to do battle. The only way to have shining armor is if the armor is unpolished, it's untested, it doesn't have any dings, it doesn't have any dirt, so it's not seen battle. Maybe the knight hasn't even seen battle. It's brand new armor, he's a brand new knight. Is that really the one you want to come rescue you from the evil overlord? The guy who has never fought a battle before, or maybe he's experienced, but he's never tested that armor. Maybe there's weaknesses he doesn't know about. Do you really want the knight in shiny armor coming to rescue you? So you can take idioms that we know and you can flip them. How could this be the reverse of what we know it's mean? So here are some interesting idioms from around the world. Take ears to the field, take eyes to the farm. Basically, it means don't pay any attention to what is going on. Something bad is going on out there, but just go do your work. Keep your head down. One afternoon in your next reincarnation. Oh yeah, you're, you're going to totally be a rock star one afternoon in your next reincarnation. It's never going to happen. Move on. Even monkeys fall from trees. Monkeys are skilled at being up in the tree. Even they fall down. Even the most skilled of us makes mistakes. There are even bugs that eat not weed. Roundabout way of saying, there's no accounting for taste. Japanese knotweed is one of the most enforced invasive species. It's a horrible plant. 
there are even people, bugs out there that will eat it, that enjoy it, that it has value to them. Sold him for an onion peel. Basically, you threw away a good relationship. Uh, cut from a tree. He was when speaking about somebody from uh, without a family. So, like, used from an orphan. They don't have a family tree anymore. They were cut from the family tree. The eye doesn't go higher than the brow. No one can go higher than their given status in life. So, again, those are things that you can play on. Uh, and you can take existing idioms from other uh, cultures and bring them into your world. Maybe they fit within the world. Maybe you don't have to totally reinvent the wheel. Pouring water to their own rice paddy. Doing or saying things for one's own benefit. So you can see there is a there is a literal world full of idioms out there beyond just the Western culture idioms that we grew up knowing about. So spend some time, look at what's important to your culture. Pull those idioms into your world. So I want to spend some time, we're going to build some idioms for a world together. So let's get some suggestions of like what's in, like what's important to our world, what's happening in our world. You know, like what's a big geography thing, geological timeline. Start throwing out some suggestions. Lake people. Lake people? Like they live in a lake or they live near a lake? Near a lake. Okay, so they live near a lake. So this lake is massive and significant to them. Is it religious or is it just, I and mean, what is it? Let's, let's go deeper into that. It's probably going to be a source of food because it's going to be fish there. Why is this lake significant to them? It's the only source of uh, clean water that they have. Only source of clean water. Are there other sources of water that they know that are poisonous? Or is it just that all the other water is too far away? Could be that uh, other local sources are poisonous. Okay, so reason. other local sources of water are poisonous. So they can only get drinkable, bathable water from this lake. So now, right now, you have the ability to represent something there. You've got this one source we know is safe, pure water. Everything else is danger. So this water tells the truth. This water is lies and poison. Try to build an idiom with that. Like a warning, some sort of idiom that would warn somebody of maybe like let's think how if we're talking about concepts, if we've got this water is truthful and pure, and this water is lies and poison, we can map that onto relationships between people. Rachel tells the truth. She is pure, we can trust her. She is pure as the lake. She is pure as the lake. It is a little bit of a simile, but you can start in She is if she says she is of the lake. She's of the lake. Rachel is of the lake. She is pure. And Kathy, I'm sorry. Yes. Oh. Uh, you are. I'm going to say, I told you, but share, share what you have, and then I'll. Uh, opposite, like, don't pour me a tanker of river water. Don't pour me a tanker of river water. Kathy will pour you a tanker of river, wa of river water with every word she speaks. Oh. She pours, she is nothing but lies and poison. Mm -hmm. Rachel is of the lake. And right away, you start getting, right away, the sense of the lake is important, the lake is good, the river is bad, the river cannot be trusted. Mm. And you have people coming in maybe from outside who don't know what that means. They don't know that they can't trust people who, when they speak, sound like the way the river flows. Maybe the river could be where you bring bad things, like that's where you go to the bathroom, or that's where you go to get rid of your trash. Yeah. So it kind of takes on that other dimension. Yeah, there could there could be another aspect to it. Yeah, there could be they intentionally like dump the bodies there. It's already, I mean it's already poisoned. It's already bad. These are unwanted things. We're getting rid of. And there could be an interesting conflict with a, with a culture, a distant culture that uses that river for travel and commerce, and they suddenly arrive to find the white people. Yeah. How can they be trusted? There are the river. Yeah. So let's think, what else? What's, what else is going on in this culture? What other things could we want to express? Let's look back at some of the... Don't bite off more than you chew. So this is a Western idiom that we all know. Don't bite off more than you chew. Don't take on a task that is beyond what you are capable of accomplishing. What sort of similar idiom could our lay people have to express that concept of don't take on a task beyond what you can do? Uh, 
dub fish with three fingers. And okay, what's the, the meaning for that? Well, the idea, any task that you take on, use your whole hand, not part of your hand. There you go. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna do a task, you gotta fully commit. Mm -hmm. You, I think you were gonna say something? Oh, uh, I was, I forgot it, sorry. <laughs> I was thinking of this. Don't try and clean the river? I mean, don't try and... Yeah, I was thinking something like that, yeah. Like, like clean river water, or not like... It's like, like what, clean, yeah. yeah, clean yeah. river water or something like that. Yeah. Oh, tr yeah, trying to, to educate that boy not to be a bully is like trying to clean the river. Right. Maybe don't haul too big a water jug. Mm -hmm. Too much to carry, weighs down too much. Yeah. Sure. I mean, we, we, we've seen the tribal women, they've got the jug on them, mm -hmm. their head, they've got a jug in each arm. That one takes four jugs down to the river every day. And carry three. So, like, there are things that you can play with that you know the physicality of how we interact with the world. Let's look at something that happens infrequently. Let's come up with some idioms that could express this concept for our lay people. We know the lake is important to them, we know the river is poison. Yep. Once in a high tide? Once in a high tide, lakes can have high tides. So yeah, so that's something that we definitely pull in. What about if, when there's bad, bad storms? If that lake, if that river is near enough to the lake, could the poisonous river flow into the lake? What, what does that represent, when poison flows into the pure lake? How could that concept be mapped onto something else? Don't drink after a storm. Don't drink from the lake after the storm. Yeah, yeah. Don't don't go fishing after a monsoon. No. There are perfect ways to map that on there because everybody knows poison has flowed into the lake. You got to give it a week to settle down. So think of a novel that you or a manuscript you're working on right now. Think of what's important to your culture. I'm going to give you guys a few minutes. And I want you to come up with three to five. I'm going to be challenging. Rapid fire. Come up with some idioms for your world. And making you work. Can you like the oh. oh, no, no. Write them down. And I'll, I'll, I want to hear some, like different idioms so we can start hearing. No, you get back to the put this knowledge to use um, yeah. slide. What is important to your culture? Is it an idiom that most people would know, or is it known only to a specific subgroup? How would your character react to hearing a specific idiom? And how would other characters react to your protagonist using a specific idiom? So when I was in the grad program, my thesis novel takes place in a world where there is a massive volcano that constantly spews ash into the sky. So an idiom that I have in my world is blue skies can lie. Just because it is a blue sky does not mean that the air is not dangerous to breathe because it can still have microscopic ash that you will breathe in and will turn your lungs to cement. Blue skies can lie. Appearances can be deceiving. Um, so in my world, there's like two different kinds of magic. There's a destructive and a creative magic, but people who are, have destructive magic aren't allowed to practice their kind of magic. So um, I came up with like someone who can't be trusted. Um, I said like so using the sentence, um, Jeff starts fires and moves earth. So like that would be a power that. Yeah. So. One that is, it's playing on, that's the destructive power, but it's also playing on, he's a troublemaker. Right. And that, the instantly. cultural perception of that. Yeah, instantly everybody in that world knows, he's a troublemaker. Mm -hmm. Doesn't even have to be somebody who can use that magic. Oh yeah, he's just, he's a fire starter. Kathy? Uh, I've got a trickster god among the pantheon that's worshipped pretty much across this world. 
uh, may Carnes bless your endeavors. So basically, I hope you fail. That's hope awesome. something goes wrong. Yeah, that's awesome. Everybody, again, instantly would know. Because within that world, you've mapped that concept of the trickster god, the one who causes problems, onto this idea of, yeah, we're giving you a blessing from somebody you don't want. Mike, can you? Oh, I've got a couple here. Uh, yeah. we were, it's a common saying amongst uh, necromancers in Pittsburgh. Um, they, they, they greet each other with the word of grace. They also greet the dead with this, mm -hmm. because it's reference to the sticks. Being in the sticks is good grace means that necromancers are not using their power and that the undead will always find rest because that's the overall role of necromancers in bring peace. I like it. I think those are good. Let's share some more. In my world, there are class divisions of people. Highborn have six digits on each hand, okay. lowborn have five. You refer to something as a five finger effort. Possibly meaning it's doomed to failure, or it's second rate, or you simply have to work harder to achieve. I like that. Now here's a question for you. In your world, if somebody is highborn, six fingers, what happens if they make a major misstep in their world? Is there a culture of cutting off one of their fingers, reducing them to a five-fingered person? That, I hadn't considered that possibility, but that's an interesting insight. Also in this world, there, are, uh, there is a, oh, I suppose in, in our measurement, probably a hundred square miles of water that varies between six inches and two feet and shifts with it's the Toddlands. Mm -hmm. And in the Toddlands are small creatures that uh, nip and drink their blood, blood puppies. So at his ankles like like blood puppies. Like it. Or carrying water to the tide lands, meaning a, a senseless or useless effort. I like it. I think those are good. And while you're talking, I was thinking of another one um, for the six finger thing. Yes. What if there's an accident and somebody loses a finger or two? Does that change the way people perceive them? Because now you've got five fingers like the low horns on that hand. It, uh, one of my characters has lost a finger on the outside, one of the extra digits, and he has a prosthetic that still identifies him. But there's still, there's still going to be idioms or metaphors attached to that concept of wearing a prosthetic. And on the lowborns, do they go about making prosthetics so that they can try to pass? Or is there laws against there, that? Uh, the lowborns don't have that kind of technology. Okay. <coughs> They're not uh, as bright. Well, I mean, but would it, would it even be as simple as they would have got a stick about the size of a finger and wrapped it to their hand so that they can try to pretend among their friends that they've got that six digit, that they're trying to pretend to be highborn. Or even a glove. Or a glove. Yeah. Little yeah. kids who would tie that stick and pretend to be a highborn child. And then one of the, one of the, um, the snubs is a lock that requires using all six digits to push things in the sequence. Yeah. That if you have five digits, you can't work it. Yeah. So, but there's gonna there's gonna be an idiom. There's gonna be some saying about a five finger person trying to press that lock, even if it's you know just something to do with how that's you know that's a stupid, that's impossible. Like they're attempting to do something that is they're worthless, they're worth below that. So what does it mean when a five-person person, a five-finger person is going to try and use that same finger lock? What does that say about who is that type of person? You've got two concepts there that you can then map onto each other for a saying that would have some pretty potent cool meaning. Anybody else? Let's get some more. I actually struggle with mine. Okay. Uh, mostly because I have a contemporary setting. Okay. And uh, the values that mm -hmm. this subculture has is more for abstract concepts, like freedom from oppression, and I couldn't really come that up with something that was not already in use, Okay, because it's more contemporary. But <coughs> okay, so we're, we're talking about, about our world, but slightly different? Yes. Okay, so what, is, what makes their world different from our world? Uh, monsters in uh, modern context. You mean a specific monster? It's all monsters. All monsters. So there are werewolves? Werewolves, vampires, vampires. Um, Chinese bloodsuckers, uh, African uh, gods. 
Okay. So everything. Okay, so it's very right crucial. away from dealing with oppression, uh-huh. Chinese blood sucker. Who who is who are the oppressors in this world? Humans. Humans are like Chinese blood suckers. Well, I mean that's like a literal. That's a very literal. But so take that concept of humans to this these people are like Chinese blood suckers. How would you? Because we, we know from the group themselves, like, because if I'm trying to think from their perspective, like, right. if that's an identifying member that is not necessarily viewed as, like, a negative thing, like, they, I don't know This if is would... what we're doing with, this, with the subcultures. So think back to when we were talking about jocks and preps and goths. They still have, they're still part of our modern world, but they have developed a language that marks them as other, on fleek, just to mean, girl, your eyebrows are on fleek. It's just a simple, one simple word, one little tiny sure. phrase that means something different to them that marks them as being different from the other. So you're saying maybe go back to a historical reference point and then bring you it back even, to the back. You could even, yeah. I mean, every every group has their different culture. I'm a knitter. I knit. Knitters and crocheters, we've got our own language. Mm-hmm. If I said, oh yeah, I was working on a project, but I had a frog in. Mm-hmm. Any, like, do you know what that means? I had a frog in my project. You had to tie something off temporarily. I had to rip it, rip it out. I completely pulled out all the yarn. I pulled out all the stitches. I went back to it just being a ball of yarn. I frogged it. As opposed to, well, I just had to tink a couple rows. Knit, spelled backwards as tink. I had to unknit a few rows. I had to tink. So I could talk to somebody else who, who knits. Maybe even if they knit and crochet, they would know some of these terms. And I could use these terms. But she could ask me, oh, how you know, I know you're pretty rum since you frogged that project. Yeah, but I, I got a new whip in progress. I got a new whip going for the, the DH. I got a new work in progress for the darling husband that I don't actually have. But um, so there is language that we <coughs> living in this modern world. I've got my own subcultures as a knitter, as a video gamer. I've got language that marks me as different from somebody who does not belong to those groups. What is what marks your group of people? Different. What marks them as other? What to them marks me as a human as other? Okay. So what is the yeah? What are more historical? Are more, more historical. What are the derogatory terms? Mm-hmm. What are they going to compare me to? The, well, yeah, the Chinese blood sucker. Mm-hmm. Something that is leeching away valuable resources from what your world needs. Mm-hmm. I'm just there and I'm taking, 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 and I'm hurting you. Mm-hmm. I'm not giving anything back. I'm a parasite. Right. Um, what in, yeah, what phrases? Are they, are your people bound to, like, you're not allowed to go out in daylight because you don't want to see monsters. Sure. So then the day means one thing to your world that it doesn't mean to mine. Right. And night means different. Night is going to be scary for me if that's where the monsters come out. Right. Whereas night, for you guys, it's just like the day. day. That's, that's the time to be. Mm-hmm. It's the sun that you have to fear. It's when the light comes out that you need to be afraid. So, start playing around with those ideas. Like, they do view the world differently, even in a contemporary setting. Sure. Yeah. Jocks and goths view the world differently. Same high school, different languages. Any other questions? I've got one. Okay. Um, my land is desert, mountain, lots of sand, lots of rock. And so you want shade because it's very hot. So if they say shade to you, it's a nice greeting meaning that when you find shelter. Mm-hmm. And if they say he's undeserving of shade, he doesn't deserve to be in the same place. Yeah. Or if you say he speaks like the sand, it shifts, it yeah. changes, so they don't trust what he says. I like that. Those are good ones. And also think about water's gonna be valuable. So like that, that person sells empty water jugs. Like you can't, you can't tell if it's made of if it's made of clay, if it's fire baked. It's a water jug. It's got its cork in it. You think there's water in it? He's selling empty water jugs to everybody. Is that somebody you can trust? What does that you know? What does that mean? What is what symbology? The idea of water and it being a necessary, uh, necessary, necessary, necessary. I can't speak necessary. I'm just gonna go with necessity. necessity. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> hour and my tongue is just like we're done. Um, so yeah, think of the things that are important that they need and you take those concepts like with lake people, the lake being pure, 
when you map, you're mapping concepts onto other things. The trick does come in with, we don't live in the post world, so when you're mapping concepts, you can accidentally miss stuff and map concepts that don't match. So if I was going to try and say like, oh yeah, that person's got great clothing style. Oh yeah, that person dresses like he, he just cooked the soup himself. What? <laughs> what does that even mean? So you have to make sure you explain things. If we were talking about like a fashion designer, and, oh yeah, he made his outfit himself, and cooking is really big in, in the culture, then maybe you can start trying to figure out a way to make that map. Oh yeah, he dresses like he, he just cooked the soup himself. He's, he is the chef of those clothes. Okay, now we're getting closer to having the two concepts map correctly. But otherwise, you're just throwing words out there and saying like, oh yeah, this has meaning. Yeah, he dresses like he cooks his own soup. There's there's no nothing there. The readers are going to feel it and go, that, that doesn't make any sense. What? So you make sure that the concepts, the abstract concept maps to the concrete concepts. So I think that wraps us up. Unless there's any one last question? Can I take one more? Nothing? Not really a question, but I recently read a white Australian YA book, mm -hmm. and it used the idiom lollipop lady. Anybody guess what it means? Okay. Crossing guard. Crossing guard. See, my first thought was Yeah, yeah. You're also in the I was like, oh, that's different. All right. Well, thank you for coming.